Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Or should I use the microphone? OK. So uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jakub. Uh, I come from Wrocław. And I'm inviting you to go there. It's a beautiful city, as well as Krakow is. So I'm really glad to be here. And I hope you're going to have lots of fun and you're going to learn with me. Uh, so let's, let's do it. I'm going to talk about uh, servers, functions, in particular, I'm going to talk about functions in the HTTP4S library. Uh, but let's begin with a little introduction. I'll ask you a question. What, what makes a server? Is it that simple? Just, just uh, There's a request that comes in, there's some magic inside the server, and there's a response that comes out. Is, is that it? Well, it, it sort of is, right? And what, what makes a function? It's pretty much the same thing. We get some arguments or arguments in Scala, and we have some magic inside the function, and we have just one result as a, as a result of that function. We, we have just one value. But the world isn't really that simple. Our lives aren't re really that easy, uh, because reality is, is often disappointing. So when dealing with servers, we actually have to think about a lot more. We had to think about resources, serialization, errors, streaming, routing, and all sorts of nasty stuff that we don't really want to deal with, but we have to. So to make, it, to make this burden easier for us, um, I'm introducing to you the library HTTP4S. Uh, I didn't write it, so it's not like I'm introducing it to the world. Anyway, it's a purely functional streaming HTTP server and client. It's, uh, it's not really just a server. It's mo more like a server uh, DSL or a client DSL that has multiple backends that you can plug in. You can use Netty. You can use uh, HTTP4S's own backend called Blaze. Or you can even use Tomcat if you're living in the 90s. So uh, it's built on CAS Effect and FS2, really, two really powerful libraries from the type level ecosystem. And it supports WebSockets, uh, but only on the server for now. Uh, it's, it, it's just gotten a new stable release, 020, like last week or this week. So uh, it's stable now and shouldn't change too much in the upcoming months. So I recommend you check it out. So. Um, to introduce how HTTP4S uh, looks like when you are using it, I need to talk about uh, functions and, and requests and servers. So previously I said that it's not as easy as making a server just a function from request to response. Uh, because, well, it's not just a function, it's also I.O. Or in the case of HTTP4S, it's going to be an abstract sort of a higher kind of type that can produce some value. It's usually going to be I.O. Uh, most likely with one uh, uh, hole of, of types or, or two. Uh, in this talk, we are going to use just, just one. So uh, we can think about HTTP4S routes or servers as, as functions. Uh, An HTTP app is a type inside HTTP4S that's basically requests to I.O. of response. And there's another one called HTTP routes, which is pretty much the same. But the I.O. contains an option, because uh, a root doesn't have to match a request. So a root doesn't have to, but an HTTP app must return a response for every request. And this sort of shape of a function that takes some input and provides and returns an effectful response, an effectful result, is, is called Kleisley. And not Kalisi, it's, it's Kleisley. Uh, Kleisley is pretty much just a function with an effectful result. It's defined in a very similar way to this in the CATS library. Another type that we need to f be familiar with is option T. And option T is just a wrapper over an effectful option, an option nested in an effect. So if we know these two types, uh, now we can look at the more real definition of HTTP app and HTTP roots. So an HTTP app is now Kleisley of I.O. from request to response. And HTTP roots is Kleisley with the same things except for the effect type. It's now not just I.O., it's option T of I.O. and something. But the real, real definition of it all looks like this. Because request and response are parameterized with their effect types. These are going to be the effect types of the 
body streams. So the entity body and the request body and the response body are streams of bytes parameterized with this effect. So that's where the F comes from here. Uh, in this talk, we are go mostly going to use HTTP roots of I.O. and HTTP app of I.O. And the real, real, like, I'm, this is the end. This is the actual code from the library. There's a common type called HTTP. That's pretty much this whole CLI-C with request and response. But the, the effect type of the CLI-C can be different from the effect type of the streams. So in the case of HTTP app, it's actually the same. But in HTTP roots, we have this option T for the, for the effect of the CLI-C. So why do we need all this abstraction? Why, why have the same types for, for uh, well, mostly the same types for, for roots and the whole application? So we'll find out later. And there's a spoiler in the corner. Uh, so let's look at the DSL. I mentioned there would be some DSL for creating servers and, and clients. So let's look at the server DSL. Uh, this is a full HTTP4S application minus the imports. Uh, and one thing I want to point out here is that there's an or not found method that converts, an, it's an extension method. It converts an HTTP roots to uh, an HTTP app. And basically, when it doesn't match, it's a 404, just not found. So it's the easiest way to convert from one to the other. But normally, we work in, uh, in terms of HTTP roots. Uh, so we have this, this DSL. Uh, what, what this off function allows us to do is not work with this option or option T. We just have a partial function, and uh, that will automatically uh, be, be adjusted to, to return an option uh, that has some value or doesn't. So uh, let's work through this, this line. Uh, first, we have uh, the most important thing. This is just a pattern match. This is just a... Uh, a pattern match on a, on, a, on a request. It's not any, any specific syntax that's you know, specific to this library. The only specific things are the symbols that we have here. But all of it is just plain old pattern matching from Scala. So first, we, Im we match on the uh, method of the HTTP request, which in this case is get. Then we have the path, which starts with a root. This is like the empty slash or nothing. And then we have uh, the right side of the pattern match. This is the actual like, body of this case. And this is just OK of Hello World. This is IO of response of IO. So yeah, this is it. So this is the simplest way to, to write a request uh, handler for slash hello. And uh, we can do other requests. We can do like post. We can do uh, all sorts of methods. Uh, in this case, I'm, I want to extract some value from the, the actual request object that's being matched on. So I just. Uh, used the syntax from, from Scala with the add operator to extract the whole request, and I, we have request body, which is, surprise, is literally a stream of bytes in I.O. So whatever you send to this, to this endpoint as a post will be returned to you in, a, in uh, yeah, just raw entity bytes. So now the client. Uh, we, we will go back to, to servers later. But for now, let's look at the DSL of the client. Uh, so it looks like this. We construct a request using the request syntax. Uh, I just say that we are going to make a get, which is the default uh, method type, uh, a get to the HTTP4S website. And the simplest way to extract the, the output of that as a string is to just call client.expect string. But wait. We don't have a client. How do we get a client? Well, we can get a client using the client builder for the appropriate backend. In this case, I decided to use uh, the Blaze backend, but there are also backends for uh, async HTTP client, OK HTTP, and so on. So uh, I just create a client, um, and it's going to return a resource. I use that resource, and inside, I can do whatever I, whatever I want with this client. And we are going to talk about resources later. So uh, we can do a lot more with clients. We can stream uh, requests. So when I, when I do this, a client does stream request, I'm going to have a, a single element stream containing a response. So I flat map that to a body, and then I have a stream 
with the entity bytes from the response, and I forward that to return that back to the, uh, to the caller. Uh, the definition of the client trait looks like this. There's a run, which is pr probably the most powerful of them all. Uh, it just, it, it is all you need to understand how a client uh, works, to, to implement a client uh, as well. So it just takes a, a request and returns a resource of uh, response, which is kind of similar to what a, a server was. So uh, we can create a client, like the easiest way is to just call the apply method in the companion object. We just pass a function that has the exact same shape as the, the above, and that will give us a client. Or we can even create a client from an HTTP app. And we are going to use this later. So now to the main focus of this talk, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about testing, resource safety, and extensibility. So let's start with testing. And in particular, we are going to talk about testing three things. Uh, we, we, we will test server routes, we will test the HTTP interface, and the client calls. Testing routes is probably the most uh, interesting because we actually have to, well, build things and check, check things. Uh, this is what you want to do like the most often. Because you don't want to start the server every time you want to test if you wrote uh, the right pattern match. You want to just s uh, apply a request to this handler and see if, it, if you got the right response, if you got the right pattern match. So I ne actually need a client here because uh, my server, my roots, need a client. So I just create one. Uh, and this is uh, how I create my roots uh, from the main class that you saw before. It's just slightly changed because it takes a client now. And I just prepare a request. I define the body as a JSON object with one field. And I just put that in as the entity of the, bo of the request. And now I run the request. I run the roots, which is a, a Clisely. With this request, I get the value, which is an option. Uh, sorry, this is now an. I owe of option of response, I flat map to value, blah, 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 and so on, and I verify at the end that the body is exactly what I sent. Or you can do it another way. You can create a client for this route using client from HTTP app, and then, or not found, and you can expect a JSON object from it. And it's pretty much the same thing, probably easier to use. Now, testing HTTP, the HTTP interface, we, in this case, we, are, we actually want to see if our, after starting our application, the server actually responds to requests. And you don't want to do this like in every test you have. You want to do this probably once per whole application, just not to waste any resources and time. So I need a client for this because I need to somehow call the server. So I use the Blaze client uh, builder. I need my server that I defined in my main class, main object. So that's defined as a resource. I use it, I use the client, and now I make an expect a call, which is a get. I make a get to the server URI, slash hello, which is just one of the endpoints that I have, and then I verify that I got the resp response that I wanted. And this is it. Now, testing clients is also quite fun. Uh, this is an example, let, let's say we have a to-do service, a remote one that we want to verify that we are talking to it in the correct way. So what we do in the actual implementation is we expect a uh, to-do, and we make a request to the uh, URI. Uh, actually, this should be with uh, the, the actual host name of the service, but let's just forget it for a second. It's a relative URI, so we, just verif we will want to verify that we are calling this slash to this uh, slash ID URL. So in our tests, we will actually need some sort of mock server but fear not, this is not actually going to be a server that starts and actually handles any incoming uh, connections. This will be just a root that we will then call. So we w we're going to use this mock server in our test. Uh, this will match the exact same request that we uh, made just a second ago, just slash to do slash int var. Uh, and yeah, so we create a client from this HTTP app this, this HTTP rules are not found. And then we pass that to the to-do client that we had on the previous slide. 
And then we can just call the method and verify that we got the right result. So that's it for testing. And I'm afraid we are going too fast, so I will slow down. Um, just one question for you. Is there too much code already? OK, cool, <laughs> because I have way more. So let's talk about resource safety for a second. There are two very powerful constructs in Cast Effect and FS2 that make it easy for us to work with resources, all sorts of resources, like uh, databases, like connections to pretty much anything, uh, some internal state in the application, files, and so on. So one of them is Cast Effect resource which is what I mentioned before, like we were building resources and using them, so this is it. Now, the definition of a resource is just uh, an abstract class. It has a single method that you want to use in most cases, like 90% cases. It's called use. So if you have a resource of type A in some context F, let's say IO, then use gives you a, the ability to do something with this A and return an I.O., and you will get the whole value of it, the whole result. But there's a catch. Once you have called this function, this use, one, it's, once it's ended running, your res resource is now no longer available. It's going to be closed. So every time you call this method, uh, the resource is actually going to be allocated. And at the end, it's going to be cleaned up. And resource.make is the most popular use case of uh, how you can create resources yourself. Uh, here's one example. We have an I.O. that creates a connection pool. And in the cleanup section, we just we close the connection pool. This is how I define one single resource. Guess what? Resource is a monad, and we can flap up on this. So this is a for comprehension, actually. So one of our resources is this connection pool. And another one that we create afterwards is a server. So we can actually build a server using this resource that we had before. And we haven't even called use yet. We only do it at the end, at the very end. So this whole block, this, this server like for DBE server, and then use for test uh, with sleep of 10 seconds, what's going to happen in, in order is the connection pool will be created. The server will start. We will sleep for 10 seconds. Now the server will be stopped, and the pool will be closed. So in that particular order. So whatever order you, you acquire your resources, they will be cleaned up in the exact reverse order, which is what you want to do normally. Now, FS2 stream is uh, pretty similar, except it's not, not really. Uh, FS2 stream is a sequence uh, of, of values, basically. But it's not like a list, because all the values can be computed by effects. So it can, ha it can be empty. It can have zero values. Or it can be infinite, even. It can have as many values as you want. And it can have effects in the F type. And in a similar way to resource, it supports uh, resource acquis acquisition and cleanup, uh, but it's actually way more powerful in that. So an example of a stream that has just three values, it's a, a pretty much constant stream. It will never emit anything else than just one to three. This is it. And it doesn't even have to have any effects. You can compile that. Uh, you, can, you can make it a list without any I.O. in your types. But this is actually quite more complex, because this actually involves I.O. So this will be a stream, a one element stream, that will use the I.O. monad uh, that will produce a single value using the random next int function in I.O. Another one, uh, this is uh, an infinite stream that will produce values every second in I.O. Now, how you, uh, how, you, how you run a stream, you have to compile it to an I.O. if it's effectful. And if it's not, you can just uh, two list on a stream. But this one is effectful, so we can compile and do two list, which is obviously unsafe because it's infinite. But you can do so much more. We can do compile drain so that will, it will just run forever. Or, well, there's a lot more. So I recommend you check out FS2 and 
see how this, uh, how this works. But you can also do like resource, uh, sorry, stream.resource, and you can pass a resource and lift it to a stream. Or you can do stream bracket, which is pretty much resource make just with streams already. So we introduced these two new types, resource and, and stream. Let's talk about how they are used in HTTP4S. So we already saw some resources in HTTP4S. One of them is Bl uh, Blaze Server Builder resource. Most of the server backends provide you a way to, to build them, build the, the servers or clients as a resource. And they usually give you a way to do it as a, as a stream. This is the wrong thing. Uh, they, they usually give you also a way to create a stream instead of a resource. And also, uh, the request of any single request, uh, of any sing yeah, any request that comes to your server or that you send with your client has a body that's of type fs2 stream with the appropriate effect, and it's a stream of bytes. So when you, when you send some JSON or some XML or whatever, there needs to be a way to convert your type into a stream of bytes. And the same goes for responses. And then you, you are going to see what, what client looks like. So in client, we already saw these two methods, run and stream, uh, which are very useful for, uh, for resource intensive work. But we have also other things, other methods that are resource safe. So fetch uh, allows us to say what, the, uh, what, what you want to do with uh, a resp response. So you send a request, and you provide a function from a response to an f of a, so an IO of a. And that will be an F of A. So you don't need to handle closing the response, like uh, making sure that you've consumed the response. This will happen automatically. And expect is the same, expect, except you need to say uh, what type you want. And there needs to be a type class instance in scope that uh, goes from a stream of bytes to your type. And they have many overloads with request, URI, a string, and I think that's, that's it. And we have two more methods, uh, status and successful, which just uh, look at the response status. And then there's a very interesting one called to closely. It's still safe, but it, it's pretty much like run, but with the arguments reversed. So instead of uh, saying what the request is and then doing uh, use, you pass the function from response to f of a and then you get a Clisely. And you don't want to use to HTTP up. Like this is the most, the only dangerous method in here, because when you when you actually use it, you use client to HTTP up. You need to handle closing the like. You, you need to drain the the body of the response yourself. Like in every request in like HTTP. So now it's. It's time for the last point, extensibility. And I'm still afraid that we're going too fast. So let's slow down a, bit, a little. If a server or a client is still a function, it's not just a simple function from request to response, but it's still a function. Uh, I need to connect a charger. <laughs> OK, let's hope that I can make it before my laptop dies. Uh, so what can we do with functions? Or actually, give me a second uh, for a break. <laughs> Just. I didn't expect this. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. OK, sorry for this difficulty. So what can we do with functions? Let's look at, an, at a very simple example without any requests, responses. Uh, let's just look at the case class with one field and the function from this case class to an int, so just underscore x. Now what can we do with this function? We can wrap it in another function 
uh, that will use whatever we passed, what, what a new function that will modify the input and the output of our function. So we can uh, wrap over our original f, and whatever we pass to it will be changed. So uh, the data that we pass, it will never reach the actual f function. It will only be, uh, the, the f function will be called with uh, a copy of, the, of data with a different x. And then the output of our f function will never be seen by us, by whoever calls f2. Because it will also be like multiplied by 2. So in a visual form, this is our f function. It, it gets a and returns b. And this is our f2 function. So it gets a, but then it changes a to something else, like a prim. And this is what f gets. And when f returns like b prim, because now it's a completely different value, we also make changes to that, and we b basically split out, spit out a completely different b. Uh, this is actually pretty interesting. Like when I was drawing this, normally you would expect that if you wrap a function, you change the well. You would expect that this would be b, but it's it's not. It's just there's one b, there's, there's three b's, and just two a's. This is pretty interesting to me. So uh, let's just recall what HTTP app was. So it's a classy from request to response in F. And let's talk about the middleware. So I mentioned this is the extent extensibility block. So I mentioned maybe that it's possible to, uh, to uh, yeah, I, I mentioned that you can change the input of a function and you can change its output. So here we won't be really talking about functions, like any functions, just, just the HTTP app. So HTTP app is a function, and we can pass that to another function to apply, and this will give us another function. I guess there's too many functions on this slide. So in this case, this is a server middleware for response timing. Uh, the implementation is pretty straightforward, but it, you don't actually need to understand it now, the important part is that uh, we use uh, the HTTP app that somebody gave us, and we, we measure how long that request takes, and then we insert that as a, as a response header to the, uh, of that call. So the, the relevant parts are here. Like we have a request that will, be, uh, that will come to this wrapping thing. We, we call the original uh, HTTP app with that request, and then we put the header into that response. So we didn't actually change the input, but we actually did something before we made a call to this HTTP uh, handler. Here's another example, and this one is just, we, we just add uh, whatever headers we got from the response, uh, sorry, from the request, we put them into the, the response. And the important part on this slide is that this is defined not for HTTP app or for HTTP routes. This is defi defined for both. Because for any F, uh, for any HTTP of F and G, we, we can wrap it, which is the point of having HTTP in the first place. Clients also have middleware. So given a client, which is also underneath, on some level, a function, we can wrap it in another one and we can build a new client. In this case, we, are, we have a middleware that adds a base URL. So if I, if I build a client using this, and then I pass to, to, uh, to this, I pass the base as like google.com, then I, I don't need to say google.com every time I make a request. I can just say like slash search and so on, and it will be added automatically. There's a, a lot, quite, quite many, middlewares built in into HTTP 4S for a server. For the client, not so many, but still very useful. And it's really pretty easy to build your own. So I would say it's pretty easy to extend. Uh, to learn more about, about HTTP 4S, you can go on the website. You can uh, ask que questions on the Gitter channel and the Cassifect Gitter channel and 
plenty of more. Uh, these are the icons I used. And this is most of what I have. Uh, we will get back to this in a sec. Uh, but I have bonus slides uh, just for this occasion. I wanted to show you how WebSockets work in HTTP4S. Um, does everybody know what WebSockets are? OK, I assume every, everyone knows. Um, so in, in this example, I have an, an endpoint that whatever you, like once you have established a connection to this endpoint, uh, a WebSocket connection, whatever you send, you will get back. And this goes for a queue that's bounded to like uh, 100 elements, stops. And I think this is really beautiful. Like this is the, the, the most beautiful way you can work with WebSockets. Just, just have two streams, like uh, the send stream. This is what we will send to the client and the receive. Like whatever we get from the client, we will put on the queue. And yeah, this is, this is pretty beautiful to me. Um, so I guess this is all I have. Uh, you can see the slides on, on this website. The code is um, in, in GitHub. And I invite you to follow me on Twitter and go to my blog. And I hope uh, you had fun and you have a nice day. So thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, I think we have two licenses for JetBrains products. So if you have any good questions, we will be rewarded. OK, there are two questions right there. What, what about the parameters and the citation of parameters? Right, uh, you mean like query parameters? Yeah. Um, right, so uh, you, it's actually a hard topic. I, I don't have an answer for this. Uh, if you want to extract parameters from a request, uh, you can define your own object with an unapply method uh, that will extract that. Or you can do it the way I, I think it's the most practical if you just um, extract uh, the whole request and get the parameter from that uh, through the parameter map. Um, yeah, this is probably the simplest way. Yeah, I don't think HTTP is really more type safe with yeah. parameters, is it? Oh yeah, okay, so we have, because you, you actually have a type class for deserializing parameters. Okay, so we don't have this in HTTP for us, but I think this can change. Uh, yeah, there, there was another question. OK, so uh, just to repeat for the video, uh, the question was mostly about production readiness. Uh, how can we monitor these applications? Are there any uh, successful stories, uh, success stories of this? So HTTP 4S uh, has been around, actually it's 020, but it's been around for like six years or, or more. Uh, so it's not a, a young product, it's, it's pretty mature. It hasn't really changed that much since the last stable version, which is a good thing. And now it's very stable because of, uh, well, it's a stable release on the Cast Effect and FS2 ecosystems, uh, which these two libraries have been um, advancing in, in progress to a stable version for, for years. So I think the general situation is pretty stable. But is it production ready? I think it is, because companies like Verizon, I think, uh, use HTTP4S a lot. They actually had one of the core developers working there for years. And uh, yeah, I hear all the time about other companies. Maybe not like giant companies from the industry, but I, I'm pretty sure there would be some. And also, uh, OVO Technology from London, they use FS2 and HTTP4S uh, in production, don't have any issues. Uh, me and my team, we actually have HTTP4S in two apps uh, for now. We're struggling with two issues. So one of them is exactly what you mentioned, monitoring. Uh, not exactly monitoring, but we are having... Uh, the problem is basically that New Relic doesn't support it. 
And that's not a problem with HTTPS, it's a problem with New Relic. Because it's a paid service that should work with anything. And if it doesn't, it should give you an API to work around it. And it doesn't, so. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but there's built-in middleware for, like, uh, for metrics. Uh, there is uh, middleware from Common for tracing. Uh, so I think the situation is pretty, uh, pretty good for that. Uh, yeah, so I, I wouldn't, like, it, of course it's a very, very uh, subjective question, is it ready? I would just look at what you, you need from a, from a library, from a serv HTTP library, and consider whether this one is ready for what you need. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? Hello? So the question was, can you, you can pattern match on the request method and URL. Can you match on other things like the MIME type and so on? So I don't, well, I think you can pattern match on anything if you try really hard. Like if, you, if you create your own extractor with an apply, you can, you can do it. Uh, but I don't think there's too much built-in support for this. Uh, but don't take this for granted. Like I haven't done this sort of thing uh, yet. Uh, so I think it's best if you look into the documentation yourself. Uh, but it's certainly possible to get whatever you want from the request if you just extract it uh, directly or through an unapply, a, a new object with an unapply method. Okay. Okay. So I think that's, that's all the questions. So thank you again. And uh, I give my voice back to uh, my friend.